Munich, November 17, 1878. My dear Howell, we arrived here night before last, pretty well fagged. An eight-hour pull from Rome to Florence. I rest there of a day and two nights, then five and one-half hours to Bologna. One night's rest, then from noon to 10.30 p.m. carried us to Trent in the Austrian Tyrol, where the confounded hotel had not received our message. And so at that miserable hour in that snowy region, the tribe had to shiver together in fireless rooms while beds were prepared and warmed. Then up at six in the morning and a noble view of snow peaks glittering in the rich light of a full moon while the hotel devils lazily deranged a breakfast for us in the dreary gloom of blinking candles. Then a solid twelve hours pull through the loveliest snow ranges and snow draped forest and at 7 p.m. we hauled up in drizzle and fog at the domicile which had been engaged for us ten months before. Munich did seem the horriblest place, the most desolate place, the most unendurable place. And the rooms were so small, the conveniences so bigger, and the porcelain stove so grim, ghastly, dismal, and tolerable. So Livy and Clara Spaulding sat down forlorn and cried, and I retired to a private place to pray. By and by we all retired to our narrow German beds, and when Livy and I finished talking across the room, it was all decided that we would rest twenty-four hours, then pay whatever damages were required, and straightway fly to the south of France. But, you see, that was simply fatigue. Next morning, the tribe fell in love with the rooms, with the weather, with Munich, and head over heels in love with Fraulein Dahlweiner. We got a larger parlor, an ample one, threw two communicating bedrooms into one for the children, and now we are entirely comfortable. The only apprehension at present is that the Climate may not be just right for the children, in which case we shall have to go to France, but it will be with the sincerest regret. Now, I brought the tribe through from Rome myself. We never had so little trouble before. The next time anybody has a courier to put out to nurse, I shall not be in the market. Last night, the forlorn tears had all disappeared, so we gathered around the lamp after supper with our beer and my pipe, and in a condition of grateful snugness, tackled the new magazines. I read your new story aloud amid thunders of applause, and we all agreed that Captain Jennis and the old man with the accordion hat are lovely people and most skillfully drawn. And that cabin boy, too, we like. Of course, we are all glad the girl has gone to Venice, for there is no place like Venice. Now I easily understand that the old man couldn't go, because you have a purpose in sending Liddy by herself, but you could send the old man over in another ship, and we particularly want him along. Suppose you don't need him there? What of that? Can't you let him feed the doves? Can't you let him fall in the canal occasionally? Can't you let his good-natured purse be a daily prey to guides and beggar boys? Can't you let him find peace and rest and fellowship under Per Jacopo's kindly wing? However, you are writing a book, not I. Still, I am one of the people you are writing it for, you understand? I only want to insist in a friendly way that the old man shall shed his sweet influence frequently upon the page. That is all. The first time we called at the convent, Pierre Jacopo was absent. The next, just at this moment, Miss Spaulding spoke up and said something about Pierre Jacopo. 
There's more in this acting of one mind upon another than people think. Time he was there and gave us preserved rose leaves to eat and talked about you and Mrs. Howells and Winnie and brought out his photographs and showed us a picture of the library of your new house. But not so. It was the study in your Cambridge house. He was very sweet and good. He called on us next day. The day after that we left Venice after a pleasant sojourn of three or four weeks. He expects to spend this winter in Munich and will see us often, he said. Pretty soon I am going to write something, and when I finish it I shall know whether to put it to itself or in the Contributors Club. That Contributors Club was a most happy idea. By the way, I think that the man who wrote the paragraph beginning at the bottom of page 643 has said a mighty sound and sensible thing. I wish his suggestion could be adopted. It is lovely of you to keep that old pipe in such a place of honor. While it occurs to me, I must tell you Susie's last. She is sorely badgered with dreams, and her stock dream is that she is being eaten up by bears. She is a grave and thoughtful child, as you will remember. Last night she had the usual dream. This morning she stood apart after telling it for some time, looking vacantly at the floor and absorbed in meditation. At last she looked up, and with the pathos of one who feels he has not been dealt by with even-handed fairness, said, But Mama, the trouble is that I am never the bear, but always the person. It would not have occurred to me that there might be an advantage, even in a dream, in occasionally being the eater instead of always the party eaten, but I easily perceived that her point was well taken. I'm sending to Heidelberg for your letter and Winnie's, and I do hope they haven't been lost. My wife and I send love to you all. Yours ever, Mark.